by Michael Schur, who was a former, the former CIA Al Qaeda leading expert, who quit recently in protest of Bush administration policies because he believes that the Bush administration is in fact the best ally that Al Qaeda could ever have asked for. Um, and he, he quit in protest and has committed his life since to trying to expose uh, how the Bush administration's policies, its policies, are uh, enraging people around the world against the United States. So this is something that Michael Schur wrote. The U.S. invasion of Iraq was not preemption. It was, like our war on Mexico in 1846, an avaricious, premeditated, unprovoked war against a foe who posed no immediate threat, but whose defeat did offer economic advantages. The, that this administration and its agenda is about the, a really natural progression, uh, looking in particular from the 1980s onwards, of the increased power, increased influence of certain multinational corporations, uh, thanks to uh, corporate globalization policy, and their interests merging uh, quite concretely with the rise of the neocons, and that what we have is uh, an agenda that is about expanding and growing the U.S. military as much as possible so that it can advance the interests of a select handful of U.S. multinational corporations. But the mythical idea that there was a 200-year period when Rome was so militarily and economically dominant that it guaranteed world peace because no country would challenge it. And therefore, it guaranteed world peace, and it was a period called the Pax Romana. The Bush administration has used the term Pax Americana. They believe we have one and that we should hold on to it. They are also very, very interested in maintaining the interests of a select group of corporations. If you look at the history of U.S. economic engagement with Iraq, uh, which was opened up by Ronald Reagan, busted open by George Bush Sr., it is a history of U.S. corporations trying to gain greater and greater access to Iraq. In particular, U.S. oil companies and oil infrastructure companies, and uh, arms manufacturers wanting to sell their wares are Bechtel, Halliburton, Lockheed Martin, and Chevron Texaco. But their history is that all of these companies uh, worked very closely with Saddam Hussein, worked very closely to increase their economic engagement in Iraq, was that he wouldn't allow U.S. oil companies into Iraq to get what are called upstream contracts. Upstream contracts are for the oil in the ground, in essence. Downstream contracts, uh, the only contract that U.S. oil companies were given, were marketing contracts. They could market Iraqi oil, but that's it. Intense concentration in the U.S. oil sector. So we had, for example, where we used to have hundreds of U.S. oil companies, now instead we have Exxon and Mobil, one company, Chevron and Texaco, one company, Conoco and Phillips, one company. That Exxon Mobil, for the past four years, has received the largest profits of any company in world history. That's bad because of the undue, incredible influence that it gives a very select handful of companies over our elected officials. This is the first time in American history that the President, Vice President, and Secretary of State are all former oil or energy company officials. So when Cheney was a Defense Secretary and then left to head Halliburton, he brought many, many members of the previous Bush administration with him. He also brought an enormous percentage of the Pentagon budget with him. He privatized many, many formerly government military services and brought billions of new dollars to Halliburton. He then returned to become vice president and brought tremendous numbers of his staff with him. Condoleezza Rice. It is well known she is an oil tanker named after her. The Condoleezza, a Texaco oil tanker. Less well known that she earned it. She spent 10 years on the board of directors of Chevron as the head of their policy making committee. She's intimately connected to this industry. It is intimately connected to her in this administration. Bechtel is another company. It's the largest construction company in the United States and has very deep roots within this administration. Lockheed Martin has a simply unprecedented umbilical link to the Bush administration. A full
16 current and past executives of Lockheed Martin work in the Bush administration. Um, the concentration of the oil sector has a huge impact. One of the things that it does is mean that the same handful of companies are in charge of exploration, production, marketing, refining, and sales. It is vertical integration. So the top five oil companies in the world produce more oil every day than Saudi Arabia sells. The companies control refining, which means that they control how much oil gets turned into gas. Ten days into the first, first term of the second Bush administration, um, Vice President Dick Cheney held a meeting, it was called the Cheney Energy Task Force, and it was a meeting to design the new uh, energy policy for the United States. And uh, if you want to know who was there, just chime back to me the companies that I was telling you about. Now, one of the things that came out of that meeting, because there was a Supreme Court ruling that forced the proceedings, only some of them public, was a table under a heading that said, uh, the United States needs to gain greater access to Middle East oil. There was a table called Foreign Suitors to Iraqi Oil. And it listed all of the oil companies from all of the other countries that Saddam Hussein had signed oil contracts with. Now, Saddam Hussein had started signing these contracts in the end of the 90s because he needed cash. Now, of course, he didn't sign any of them uh, with U.S. oil companies. And none of the contracts could come into play while the sanctions were in place. But the writing was on the wall. Global public opinion had turned aggressively against the sanctions. If the sanctions were removed, all of those other oil companies would get all of that oil. The United States would be shut out. So the other thing that happened was a working group that was found, uh, formed in the Bush administration's State Department, which was designed to um, rewrite Iraq's oil laws. And one of the ideas that they came up with in this State Department working group was that Iraq should adopt something called production sharing agreements, a form of contract that no other oil-rich country has in the world, not a single Middle Eastern oil company, and it grants private foreign access to Iraq's oil on unprecedented uh, terms. Now, this oil law was being drafted. At the same time, a company called Bering Point was given a contract uh, in the United States before the war to rewrite Iraq's economic infrastructure. And that plan was put, to, put in place to the T by L. Paul Bremer, the head of the, U uh, the administrator of the U.S. occupation government of Iraq. That restructuring busted open the door for U.S. companies, including uh, Bechtel and many others, who were hoping to privatize. Uh, there was a very extensive process of looking at which companies should be privatized, how they could be privatized, uh, water services and the like. The changes that Paul Bremer put into place laid the groundwork for a slower process of rewriting Iraq's oil infrastructure. The reason why this process was slower is because the oil companies were smarter than the Bush administration. They knew that, for example, the Bremer orders are illegal under international law. You can't fundamentally restructure the laws of a country that you occupy. So the oil companies wanted it to be done by a new government in Iraq that would change the laws itself, sign the contracts itself, and have it all be legal. So right now, the new oil law, which was proposed by the Iraqi government, but it was proposed by Ayyid Alawi, a former CIA operative who was appointed the first um, prime minister of Iraq by the Bush administration, has been advanced by Abdel Mahdi, uh, one of their scholars. Um, one of the members of the State Department working group that I mentioned was appointed one of the first oil ministers of Iraq, and in that position he canceled all of those pre-existing oil contracts. So those are all gone. And this oil law is moving its way through uh, the Iraqi Parliament, uh, uh, it is said to be about to be passed uh, by the end of this year. If it passes and the contracts are signed, the oil companies will need a security force. And that security force is what is now proposed to be 200,000, it's currently 140,000 American troops. And that it is this oil timeline that is driving the war, the oil timeline that is keeping us there. Now, the oil time isn't the only thing we're of the only company. Lockheed, Halliburton, Chevron, they're all members of something called the U.S. Middle East Free Trade Coalition. So with the threat of the Iraq War, the Bush administration has advanced aggressively, successfully,
the U.S. Middle East Free Trade Area. It is a series of bilateral negotiations between the empire and every individual nation of the Middle East. The agreements are being signed. They're being signed quickly. Nobody knows about the U.S. Middle East Free Trade Area, particularly people in the Middle East. And the negotiations are moving rapidly, as I said. And so what these corporations are getting is what they never had before. U.S. oil companies didn't have access to upstream oil in Iraq. At the end of the war, they very, very well might. U.S. corporations have had access to the Middle East, but always on the terms of the governments uh, within the Middle East. Now that is something that will be eroded.